please come and sit down. The, the nicest places are front. Don't be shy. Uh, so I'll invite uh, John and Andy to come up. So thank you for all for coming. It's wonderful to see so many people here on something we organized uh, very spontaneously. So uh, uh, first couple words about us, um, about Focus, and we'll introduce our guests. So Udara Focus has been uh, working here in Croatia for almost 30 years now. Uh, our motto is uh, change yourself to change society, because we all love to just complain that other people should change first and not work on ourselves. Uh, so we do, uh, we have various parts of focus that work with uh, families, students, athletes. I work in a part that works with business people. Uh, and we try to figure out how to apply biblical principles, the example of Jesus uh, in everyday life. But we think you can learn from anybody. So it's really important to us that we welcome all kinds of Things I, a long, long time ago, worked in my field as an electrical engineer for a while, and I just remember how it's really interesting how every profession has its own really interesting moral choices, different things that come up in it. So this is a real, a real privilege for us this evening to listen to a conversation about franchising. I know next to nothing about franchising, but I think one thing that I found really fascinating is that uh, guess what percentage of NBA basketball players go bankrupt after their careers? Does somebody throw out a number? 19? 90, yeah, yeah. Supposedly it's about 60. 60% 60 of professional NBA players are bankrupt eventually. Uh, one very good counterexample of this is actually Shaquille O'Neal. Shaquille O'Neal uh, uh, went back to school, got, got a lot of education, and got a lot of investment advice. And the guy owns like just hundreds, right, of uh, he used to own these like pretzel stores. He owns Papa John's Pizza locations. So he, the guy is like one of the biggest promoters of franchising in the United States publicly uh, as a model for how to have and sustain a successful business. So I, I, I think I'll learn a lot this evening myself. Um, is he coming? No, Shaquille O'Neal. <laughs> He said if there's anybody over two meters here, he couldn't come, so. Um, okay, so I'd like to first ask a question. So there's a lot of people kind of way up in the corner over there. There's still four very nice seats up here in front. I know, okay. And in the corner. Right? And in the corner, yeah. You can sit over here and stuff. Yeah. While I'm asking this question, you can move. So, okay, so I'm gonna give you three choices and raise your hand when I'm done with the one that fits you best. First is you're here because franchising really interests you. But wait a second, I'll give you three choices. Your first, because your franchising really interests you. The second is you're here for leadership, general business principles, stuff like that. And the third is you're here because you went to the men's weekend, you had such a great time, you wanted to see John one more time. So those are your three choices. So number one, who's here because particularly like franchising really interests you? All right, that's a good, that's a good number. Okay, who's here because you know, business and general leadership, stuff like that is, is your biggest interest? Okay, great. And then who's here because you went to the men's weekend and had so much fun you came back? Wow, okay, that's a good number too. So, so we got a balanced group, so I think you guys can go somewhat into the deep details of your <laughs> particular expertise, uh, but try and be merciful on those who maybe are just uh, not as familiar. Um, so that's fantastic. Uh, so short introduction. John, do I say Piewitz? Piewitz. John Piewitz is executive vice president and chief financial officer of Glow Brands, a franchising business in Kentucky that operates franchises of Sun City, which is a tanning salon chain, Planet Fitness, an exercise gym chain, and cra uh, uh, what's, the, what's it called? Soap. Buff, City soap. Buff City Soap, a craft natural soap brand. Like you go and you actually like mix up your own soap? You make a lot of it. That's really, really interesting. Okay, so since he joined in 2009, their business has grown from 75 stores and $48 million in revenue to over 190 total stores and $180, $180 million in revenue. So please welcome John Pewitz. Uh, I guess Andy Andrea Cholak, Andrea Andy Cholak, uh, is CEO and a co founder of Surf and Fries. I think the most successful and innovative domestic franchising brand that has come out of Croatia. He's also founder, founder of the Cholak Franchise Consulting Groups. They operate 26 stores in Croatia and have recently expanded to 20 countries around the world, including the United States of America. So thank you so much. <laughs> Uh, 
and I particularly am thankful to Andy because I was referred to him to ask him to come here, and I didn't know he doesn't live in Zagreb, and so he said yes, and then told me he's from Rijeka, so um, I, I'm glad I didn't know because I probably wouldn't have had the guts to ask him if I hadn't known that, so Andy, thank you for coming to Zagreb this evening. Uh, and. Uh, um, it's really, really great to have you guys here. So the structure of our time is we're, we need to end around 7.30, so Andy can go back. I'm going to let the, these two guys go at each other and then maybe just jump in if they say something I don't understand. Uh, 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 and uh, uh, we'll try, and around 7.15 then, we will uh, open up and uh, have questions. So that's, that's as far as my introduction goes. Again, thank you so much, both of you, for being here this evening. This is a wonderful privilege for us, and, and you can tell from the response that there's, there's interest in this this area so this is this is gonna be exciting so each of you can take a mic and uh, I don't know if maybe you guys did a little game plan or not but just go for it all right yeah Great. we didn't make a game plan sure no problem okay well I was wondering we, we did get to talk just a little bit in the back but uh, I had read some before I came here about how you started with a small re retail uh, real estate listing company. And I'm just curious, you know, how you first got started with the entrepreneur and starting small and, and getting, you know, growing from there. OK, uh, that's a good question, because sometimes uh, I, I wonder the same thing <laughs> now looking back. Uh, look, to be honest, uh, uh, I think it's about the freedom, uh, so uh, uh, being your own boss and uh, uh, creating something from scratch, uh, at least for, for, for me, it, it cannot match to anything else, uh, meaning that you, you basically really take uh, your life into your own hands and, and take all the responsibility and basically try to have fun along. So uh, uh, that's how it worked for me. Uh, to be perfectly honest, uh, a lot of times, especially what is it now, about 20 years ago, I don't think I actually understood what, what I was doing uh, and what liabilities I'm, I'm taking as a, as a business owner. And uh, also looking back, I think that's sometimes a good idea. So uh, not knowing things is sometimes a blessing. So <laughs> yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, so yeah, regarding that first company, uh, uh, the, 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 the truth is that uh, at that point I was in... Uh, in Canada where I was studying marketing and uh, uh, when I got there uh, I went into one of the uh, uh, grocery stores and at, at the exit I saw a, a real estate guide and before I came to Canada I actually worked as a real estate agent here oh. actually in Croatia in, in Rijeka and I looked at that and I said man we don't have this back home <laughs> and after my first semester I, I couldn't, I just had to do it. So after my first semester, I, I went on a plane, went back to Croatia, started, well, the company, we, we didn't have the, the money for the company, the 20,000 kunas back then. So, yeah. so we did Obert for 500 kunas. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and, and then uh, th that's how we started the project. When I say we, it's uh, uh, myself and uh, my partner, Dennis. He's, he's still working with me in, in Surf and Fries. And uh, uh, so I went back to Canada to study and then back to Croatia to work semester, semester. Good thing was all the case studies of my college were based on my real company in Croatia. So <laughs> that's how I gained a lot of, you know, answers and knowledge and so on. So that's, that's how we started. That's great. That's great. So uh, you told me that you started from financials, if I understood. Right. Yeah. So, I mean, uh, uh, what made you made the decision to actually go into financial industry overall? Because, you know, when I think financials, I think numbers, mm -hmm. mathematics, you know, so, uh, something that a lot of things find very challenging. So right. what made you went into a, a, a financial industry? Well, growing up, I was always good with numbers a couple of times. Even in uh, first grade when I was six years old, my teacher put me into my own math class and she spent some time on her own coming up with uh, 
puzzles and challenges for me. And so I've just kind of always had a knack for numbers and wanted to find a degree that I could do numbers with. And uh, I was a math major, then an accounting major, international business in between there, and then ultimately graduated with a degree in accounting because I just found that I was very good at it, but I was happy that I never actually worked day to day as an accountant. My first job was doing financial analysis and, and creating models for a real estate developer who, you know, they built a golf course and then they would build homes all around it. Mm -hmm. And they were trying to figure out how to maximize the profit of the entire development, how fast to build out the homes and what margins, how much profit to make on lots they would sell or should they build the homes themselves, things like that. And so there were a lot of variables to build in and I really enjoyed the modeling nature of that. And then from there, worked in a couple of retail companies and, and helped to evaluate the profitability of promotions or various pricing programs, things like that. And I just loved that strategy end of things. So that was how my career developed before I got to the point in the last 15 years of working with some guys who were very entrepreneurial and, and really had the ability to put those to use in, a, in an entrepreneurial perspective. Mm -hmm. so, cool. Yeah. yeah. It's funny when, when when you mentioned golf courses and and you know, it's normal to to have a real estate development as a part of the concept, mm -hmm. right? Which in Croatia, it's we still having trouble understanding that. Mm -hmm. Which for me, it's unbelievable because uh, uh, Croatia is a as a mainly country that focuses its economy on tourism. And we haven't developed uh, golf courses, which is, uh, uh, from one point, like you would think, what's wrong with this country? On the other hand, I think there's a huge opportunity there. And uh, at some point, I hope that uh, uh, it, it will go through. Uh, I, I do a lot of sailing, mm -hmm. and I sailed as a kid. And we know what uh, uh, Atsi Marinas uh, did for, yeah. for Croatian nautical tourism. It did amazing stuff. And you can, <clears throat> one, one uh, uh, funny uh, uh, information is that uh, Veljko Barbieri, who was the founder of uh, Atsi Marinas, uh, built, uh, I think, 17 marinas in 14 months in 1984 wow. without uh, one cent of government money or the loan from the banks. Wow. So imagine what can be done and the effect it has on the economy today and, and, and so on. So I, I hope that one day somebody will come up and do the same thing with golfing because I think, you know, when we ask ourselves, okay, how do we make our tourist season longer? I think golfing is a pretty simple way to do it, you know? So, yeah. Anyway, sorry about that. I just couldn't. And by the huh? fact that interesting fact that you might be, Croatia is a small country, less than 4 million people, the largest charter fleet in the world. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, so it's yeah. about, I think, almost 40% of the entire world charter is in Croatia. Wow. So the effect that, you know, that project had on, on, on the industry and so on is just amazing. So, yeah, yeah. sorry about that. No, <laughs> just that's great. <laughs> so I'm curious. Uh, if you're starting a franchise business or if you're becoming a franchisee, you're taking a concept that's already proven and there's there's a lot of value to that. You you have a game plan that someone else has, has already proven can work. But in your case, a lot of what you've done is, um, is finding something new, uh, identifying a need, and then filling a, a gap somewhere. How, how do you go about, you know, just like your mental process of finding the need, shopping the competition, if there, or if there's no competition, you know, kind of building the awareness of the consumer for something that they're not really familiar with? Yeah, that's another crazy <laughs> part. <of that. laughs> Look, I mean, a lot of things that you do when, when you create, it's, best, it's basically irrational. I mean, you cannot explain it in a rational way. Oh, no, because you don't know, you know. So there's a lot of trial and error. So the first company that I mentioned, the publishing company, it went really well. So, uh, uh, you know, we built it from nothing. Five years later, we actually sold it to international uh, uh, corporate company and so on. And we made good money on it. And then in 2009, and that was just before the crisis hit, so we sold it in 2008. And everybody, oh, you're so smart. And I said, no, I'm so, I'm not smart. I was just lucky. <laughs> so that was it. And in 2009, we started Surf and Fries Company. Why we started it is like, okay, so we sold this company, and uh, Dennis and I, and we said like, okay, now what? 
<laughs> so, uh-huh. and, and, and he said, well, you know what? I remember this guy that, that was in Rijeka in our hometown. He's 10 uh, uh, years older than me. So in, in the 70s and in the 80s, he used to sell French fries and then went really well. People loved it and so on. And I said, oh, that's a good idea. <laughs> and that's how we started it. I mean, wow. uh, uh, basically, there's nothing rational behind it. There's just an idea. And in my opinion, it's not about what you do, but actually how you do it and, and, and how you execute the idea. Mm-hmm. So for us, the key thing was number one, packaging, because he remembered that, you know, w- when you serve a uh, 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 classic Belgian style fries, they're usually in a cone, paper cone, mm-hmm. and then you put fries and then you put mayo on top. And then the top fries are full of mayo. The bottom ones don't have any mayo. Okay, for you guys from US, we, we have mayo with fries. It can be ketchup as well. <laughs> so anyways, uh, uh, and we started working on a packaging. So we started working on a cone that can actually hold the cups for sauces. So that was the idea. And then when, when, when we solved that, then we added uh, a ring that can hold a drink. And then we added the front compartment that can hold some protein items like chicken. So... That was number one. Number two, it was branding. For us, uh, uh, at that point, I read the book, uh, Jim Collins, Good to Great. Mm -hmm. And then you have, you know, he explains where do you want to go with business? And then there's three circles. It's like where you have a good market, where uh, what you're uh, really good at uh, and uh, what, uh, yeah, where you can be the best and uh, what you're passionate about. And I was like, man, passion about potatoes, I don't know. <laughs> but uh, uh, at that point, we were crazy about windsurfing. Oh, wow. So I said, okay, let's drop that into the equation. And, you know, that was our creative platform. So it, it, that's, that's why the name of the brand is Surf and Fries. And that's why we have hibiscus flowers and palm trees and so on. That's where we got, okay, we need to bring the beach style, uh, you know, into the urban area and, you know, and things like that. And then we opened that first store to see what will happen, and it just simply exploded. And we, we, we averaged about 1,000 transactions per day from 27 square meters. And is that, that the one on the square? Uh, no, that was the one in Rijeka. Oh, Rijeka yeah. yeah. And this is, you know, uh, at that point, you think that, you know, you, you're just whatever you touch will turn into gold. <laughs> well, what a mistake that was. So uh, anyways, so people always hear about the good Part, you know, but actually there's many projects that I started personally that turned out to be a, a failure, which in my opinion is just a normal thing. So you have to count with that, that you will have the ones that fail or you will have ones that will succeed. So it, it's, it's, you know, failure truly is a part of the success. So when you ask me how do I decide, I think mostly it's the gut feeling. So. Pretty much, I'm sure that I'm completely opposite of you. You probably look at the numbers. <laughs> so anyways, that, that, that would be my story. But I, I would love to hear how you do it, because I think your approach must be very different than mine. <laughs> well, it, it is, but I think there's value on both sides. Uh, I'm not by nature, I, I'm much more analytical and, and not quite as entrepreneurial. I've, I've grown to be more entrepreneurial really in the last 15 years working with a number of guys who are very entrepreneurial, start lots of businesses. And like you said, you don't bat a thousand. We we launched a pizza concept, which I thought was great. And, and some people thought was great, but we never quite had the numbers. It did. It was doing a little better before COVID. And then uh, it, it was not a pizza that would travel well. It was thin crust. It didn't hold the heat. So if you were in the restaurant, it was great. If you put it in a box to take it home, and by the time it was cold, it didn't reheat well. So after COVID, it did died but we had some other smaller things that didn't work well but we definitely you know our team and and i part of the you know my focus my area of expertise is the analysis and so you know we're having a lot of discussions i do a lot of modeling of kind of what are the ranges okay if this is the expected level of revenue what if we're you know 10 percent above or 20 percent below you know how much room do we have for uh you know for being off from our projections before it really becomes a problem or how much capital do we need to put in to not 
stress the business in the first year or two or to depend too much on bank financing uh, because if if the ramp up period is, is slower than what you think and you're undercapitalized, then you can have a great concept but fail just because you didn't have access to enough capital to really get through that initial phase or to put enough money into marketing, especially if it's something where the customer is not as familiar with it and you really have to do some work to get customers to understand the value of, of a new product or service or something. So uh, that, that's been interesting and uh, I think, so we try to be analytical but uh, really, some of our business has, have been franchises, and then some of them are just where we had ideas or saw something like you that we thought, hey, we can do that. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. Got it. So, yeah. uh, <clears throat> if, if we can dive, uh, dive a bit yeah. deeper, because yeah. now, some, yeah, there were, there were yeah, now, now I'm getting interested. <laughs> so, uh, uh, you know, in, in, in franchising, there are certain standards, right? So, uh, uh, how would I say that there, you know, when you buy a franchise, you would pay something that is called entry fee. That's like one time off uh, for for one uh, uh, franchise contract. Then after that, you you would have a, what we call royalty fee, which is like percentage of your revenues that you're paying uh, to the principal. And you also have things like, okay, what is the total investment? And and the thing that you said. It's something that I'm trying to learn my clients as well. When you talk to the franchisee, you know, have them realistically look at what what actually amounts of capital they need to start this franchise because they're usually like, okay, how much the uh, equipment costs? Yeah, okay, that's one part of it. But then, you know, you need the fit out, you need uh, the key money sometimes for the location, you need the budget for, for launching in terms of marketing. And then on top of that, you need the capital for three to six months, usually till, till the thing gets going, you know, and so on. So just to give you a, a bit of an intro on, on, on where I'm getting at. So <clears throat> when you're buying, a uh, let's not say buying, but let's say when you're looking into different franchise systems mm -hmm. and, and maybe somebody from here tomorrow will, will also be looking for to, to get some franchise for creation market or uh, something like that. Uh, what would be the key numbers that you're looking at? Are you looking at the return on investment or are you looking at you know, resilience, um, but, you know, in terms of numbers, are there certain percentages within which ones you would be or a time frame that, you know, okay, we need to get our ROI within three years or something like that? How, how do you see that? That's a great question. I, the return on investment is something that we're always looking at, but I would say equally important to our group of guys was the margins. We would prefer to get into businesses that are higher margins because there's more room for uh, you know, variance mm -hmm. if, if you start slow or if you have some locations that outperform but others that are not doing as well. Uh, some of them we've had to figure out uh, the franchisor didn't have a lot of information about what are the best markets to go into. And so we were a little bit guessing, you know, should it be big markets? Can you go into smaller markets or suburbs or where there's a little less people, but maybe also less competition? Mm -hmm. And so the high margins were important to us. And we didn't mind if it was a business that took a lot of capital on the front end, as long as the margins were higher. Like the gym business is very much mm -hmm. that way. It may take two or three million dollars to open one gym, but the margins are very high. You mainly have the rent or the mortgage for the property and the labor, and that's about it. So there really are very good margins and especially the incremental benefit of each additional customer, each additional member or dollar of revenue. Maybe you're in a business where 80% of that goes to the bottom line once you have all of your fixed expenses covered. And so we really looked at the margins and the return on investment. And for return on investment, we are always hoping that we could make our money back on average in three to three and a half years. And, it, and if that's the average and some are five years, that's okay. Mm -hmm. And if some turn out to be one or two years, that's great. And, and hopefully we don't end up having to close many locations. And if the margins on the business are good, then that's rare. Mm -hmm. So, 
here's another question. So <clears throat> you are basically uh, what what we in in uh, in the industry would call either a area developer or a multi unit, right? Something mm -hmm. along those lines, right? right. So <clears throat> look, we in Croatia we're not that used to that stuff, but you know it, it turns out that having just one unit usually doesn't pay off. You know you, you need to have at least mostly five, I would say, where you know at, at the third. Uh, unit you're actually starting to make money so you need to think is that because of the experience you gain or just the numbers 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 okay. numbers so you, you know you, you, you can explain sure. more detail but uh, it, it's about like some some expenses would be fixed mm -hmm. the same for one location or five locations so you know you have to think in those terms so they would this this pair on, on the number of locations so uh uh where i was getting at so <laughs> anyways uh, uh oh yeah exactly so uh, if you would give advice here, uh, if, you, if we are looking into a multi-unit or area development, mm -hmm. uh, what percentage as a default rate would you consider normal? So let's say if you're developing, I don't know, uh, 20 units in one territory, what do, you, what do you feel would be a normal default rate or what percentage of them would be like I don't know not making that much money or just barely breaking even and what percentage should be the ones that are actually you know doing really well okay so I think the answer would be a little different depending on the margin so in our higher margin business in with the clubs the work, fitness or in the Suntan City um, you know it it's probably uh, a single digit default rate, uh, but what default rate? okay, or close. Like, how many of your units are are not going to be profitable? Um, is how we would look at that, and and so we would expect that would only be single digits, as long as we're doing things well and doing our research, um, picking good locations, those kinds of things. But with other concepts that are not as high margin, like food, we've not done a lot of food, a little bit of uh, chicken or barbecue or pizza. Those had a, because the margins were maybe ten to fifteen percent, maybe eighteen percent for a good location. Whereas the tanning salons and the gyms were 30, 40, 50 percent margins, those had a higher default rate, probably for us, 20 to 25 percent, especially when we were trying to come up with our own concepts. Um, franchising may be a little better, but um, that, that's, that's something to understand that even on a good concept, all of your locations are not going to be successful or not successful, certainly at the, the level that you hope that they will be. So. Uh, thank you for that, because the reason why I was asking that is mostly because I get a sense that in Croatia, a lot of people are very judgmental if you are not 100% successful on everything, you know, so, which is completely wrong and it doesn't work. So uh, I, I just wanted to hear from you that it's normal, you know, even if you have a successful concept to have a, uh, you know, a single digit number of, of unsuccessful within that group. So that's that's a perfectly normal thing. Right. So I had a question for you. So I'm maybe different than a lot of entrepreneurs I know who start businesses and they're 100% owner or maybe have one partner where really the group of, of guys that I work with, there's eight or nine of us. And so a lot of us own single digit percent, but we have, you know, it's kind of gotten to the point. I, I enjoy having only five or 10% ownership in something, but with, you know, eight or 10 guys effort uh, versus 100% of my own effort because my area of expertise is limited to primarily finance and some other elements that are more support elements, but I'm not really an expert in operations. How do you think about um, if you were going to have a partner, how, how do you evaluate the value of doing it on your own and being 100% versus bringing on a partner and what what attributes are you looking for in choosing a good partner? Well, that's a good one as well. Look, um, so uh, I tried, I think, pretty much any combination in terms of partnerships. So uh, with a consulting company, um, I don't have any partners. With Surf and Fries, I have one partner. With some uh, other projects, I had like five or six partners. So... Uh, uh, I honestly like having partners in business, 
Uh, but the the problem is with the market such as Croatia that I, I still feel it, it hasn't reached its potential in terms of people being well educated and experienced and so on. We're still so young and so green and so in development and so on that it's very hard to find you know, a, 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 a partner that it specializes only in one segment and then the next one in the next segment, which is a way how you built a very good team. So the limitation that I see is not uh, 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 in a concept of partnership or how do I look at it. It's the resource of partners. <laughs> There's sure. just not, not that many. But uh, uh, so it's, it's hard to find like one guy's really good for legal yeah. tax compliance. One guy's yeah. really good in, fin in uh, yeah. uh, accounting and strategy. And put those guys in the team together. Yeah. And, and then on top of that, you know, they, they, they need to have enough time for a new project. Uh, on top of that, they need to be a, a team player. And so and, and they, they just need to be a good fit in terms of that they understand the culture of the company that you're trying to build. So, I mean, you know, that, that's, that's a hard one. Uh, How would you find your best partners? Huh, uh, for example, Dennis and I yeah. worked at the real estate agency table next to each other. I came before, so I was actually his mentor, which was funny because he was older than me. So, and, and, and you know, we're just people that get along and we don't have, I would say, not, not any issues. So, and it's been a partnership for like 20 years. Okay. Uh, 50, yeah, yeah, 20 years, oh my God. Anyway, so uh, uh, that's one thing. The other, I don't know, for example, I had one company that, you know, a guy reached out to me and said like, hey, what do you think of this? And I said, yeah, that, this is a great idea. And so it was an app. Uh, and then, oh, well, let's do it. And then for me, it doesn't take a lot of convincing. Well, let's go. <laughs> That's how it is. Uh, with, uh, uh, with one other partnership, uh, it's right here, very close. The, the company is called Friendly Fire. It's a gaming cafe. Uh, it, it, it came out of uh, uh, basically, uh, you know, uh, David came to me and asked for my consulting services. And then I got in deeper into the concept and I said, man, this is great. And he said, well, can you actually help me grow it? And I said, okay. So we made kind of like equity deal, yeah. the small percentage, but that's what you want. And I feel that's generally speaking as, as advice. I think what you are doing is it's a very good way. And, and it turned out for me as well that, you know, have more projects where you have a small share. Because in Croatia, it's mostly when people do partnerships is 50-50. And that can go so wrong. Mm -hmm. And I've seen like, you know, a lot of people would come to me and say like, man, you, you are partners for so long and we keep fighting and well, what's your advice and so on. And <clears throat> here, like we still don't understand different clauses like tag along, drag along and, and things like that. People never heard of that. I learned it also along the way, yeah. but I think uh, for having a good partnership, I would have have very clear uh, clear, clear rules on how to exit <laughs> if things come. Uh, one thing that I learned in the U.S. it's called a uh, shotgun clause. That's so simple, <laughs> you know. <laughs> if I have a partner and I want to buy him out, I come to him and I say like, "Look, I would here's a shotgun clause for my contract." I offer you, I don't know, 100,000 euros, but if he says, no, no, I'm giving you 100,000 euros, I have to take it and, and get out. Uh -huh. It's simple, but it works. Uh -huh. Much better than ending up in a court and suing and company going under and so on. So yeah. in terms of partnership, that's how I th see things. Keep, you know, keep things very simple and straightforward. And you can always expect that, you know, oh, one will, one partner will <clears throat> work harder or something, or they will feel that they do that, or you will feel that way, and so on. So, uh, it, it, I mean, it's it's complex thing, but it's never ideal. And w when you go through time, you will see that at some point you will actually go down and then your partner will pick up the slack and, and vice versa and so on. So it, those are things that you can actually expect that that will happen. But uh, uh, having more partners, but each one doing their own, what they're uh, specialized in, I think it's the best. And yeah. where we can also see it, it's something that it's now kind of happening in Croatia. We see that first private equity funds are 
uh, uh, being created uh-huh. and that are functioning. Mm-hmm. And that's how they work. Yeah. Because they have what, what they call uh, uh, GPs, general partners. <laughs> and it's usually five or six of them. And each one of them is specialized in something. So, and, and so far it looks that they're good. The problem is when you have five or six guys and nobody specialized in anything, <laughs> then you have a chaos. So I have kind of a follow-up question on partners. Not, and not so much maybe the business operating partners, but a, a financial partner or financial backing. So let's say you've got a concept and you've, you've either you're starting or you've just started and you're wanting to build it and you're pretty confident that it's good. Would you rather, uh, you know, like as you look at pros and cons, is it better to give up some of the equity to bring on more money and build it faster or go a little slower and keep more control? And if you can, of course, in the early days, sometimes it may be hard to get bank financing, which is the cheapest. And so you have to give up equity. How, how would you give someone advice on balancing giving up equity to grow something faster versus keeping more of it? Okay, so uh, first of all, in Croatia, it's a bit different than, for example, U.S., because uh, getting finances here, it's really hard, especially uh, in a startup phase. Uh, our banks are very conservative, very regulated, so uh, that, that's something that, you know, it's, it's, it's a hard one. Uh, bootstrapping is something that most of the new companies do, and, and, and that's how I did it most of the time and and uh, i think it's a good thing uh, taking on the capital for the equity i think it it's a good idea but you have to be very disciplined and you have to stay motivated and what i've seen uh, uh, so far uh, not only in croatia but in some other places is when when they get a partner that will finance you know like and take the equity share they spend that money like it's not theirs. And that's where the trick is. You know, you, you yeah. still have to keep your, you know, like, like you're still bootstrapping basically, but you have some capital. But people start spending that like, like nothing, you know, because they, they, they don't feel the, the, the weight of it. And it's always the problem going back to the partnerships is like <clears throat> what we've seen here so many times. There's a guy with the idea, there's a guy with the money. Never do that. There has to be a skin in the game from both ends. That, that's, that, that, that would be my advice. Why? Because when the problems come, and they will, 100%, the guy that didn't put any money in, and it was his idea, he will run away right away because you know, he got nothing to lose. And the guy with the money will be stuck in huge problems. <laughs> That's good. That's helpful. One of the things that that we have done, and and I'll kind of give a comment and you can comment on it, as we have built businesses, one of the things that my, my partners and I look to do as often as we can is to build something where after we've built it and put in a lot of effort, however much it takes to really get it rolling and and started and going well, then that it can run without us as much as possible. So a lot of times we're looking at maybe bringing on operating partners who we train up eventually to be able to at least oversee the operations. Maybe we still provide all of the back-end support of accounting and payroll and human resources and information technology, marketing, whatever, but at least having someone who can run the operations for us. And a lot of times giving them some percentage, maybe it's only two or three, four, five percent, but it's something that gives them, it, it makes a mental shift, what I've found, to give an owner mentality for them and they start to operate it like it's their business. And I'm thinking of that where you mentioned, you know, people need to have some skin in the game, something to lose, so it's not just their paycheck. What are, is your experience? Yeah, I uh, fully agree. Uh, so it's, uh, I call it option pool. Uh, so uh, we were building one company, again, going back to that uh, uh, app company, and that's where we had actually a, a, a 20% option pool. And <clears throat> so Can you we, say a little bit of what that is? Yeah, so let's say you have 100% of the company, and then this company was meant to build an app for uh, nautical uh, <laughs> industry where you make a reservation for your birth for, for, for your boat uh-huh. because we have a, a huge problem with, <laughs> with that uh, when you go sailing. So anyways, uh, uh, but you need somebody to build the whole software, you know, to write the code and so on. So how you do it, you take 20% of that company 
and you divide it between developers, so you give them shares, and a good advice on that that I learned is that uh, you have a, a, a kind of like milestones that they need to reach and achieve in order to actually get that shares. And <clears throat> if you want to know more about that, I think you should look because we just got a new law in Croatia for uh, ESOP. So yeah, that's brand new, right? Yeah, yeah, that's that's a brand new, and I think it's a good thing that that yeah. we have that now yeah. because uh, before it was. You say what the ESOP is. Uh, yeah, so it's uh, uh, employee stock options, basically. So it's it's what we are talking about, and the new law is now out, and it's not penalized through taxation anymore that heavily because it used to be, I think, hundred and. 50% or something like that, which made no sense. And now it's, I think, at some 30% or something like that. But uh, uh, I think it's definitely a, a good thing to have uh, 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 that small share of, of the company as incentive uh, for, uh, uh, for uh, employees, for the key employees. But m my advice would be definitely have that vesting, uh, is, is uh, uh, w w what we call it, to, to have them... Uh, certain milestones that they have to hit or deliver in order to actually have those shares. Right. Mm -hmm. That That's vesting cool. part is one of the things that after one or two early companies that our group did where a couple of people got in, got some ownership and left very quickly, uh, we went back and added more vesting controls. And we thought that they were committed parts of our team, but you know, everyone does not have the same mentality. And so- So like pre-vesting, yeah. what is it? It's like, you, you now know, okay, if I stick around for three more years, I'm, I'm at the point I'm gonna own 1% of this company. And that right. company seems to be worth this much, just wow. Uh, this is not worth 50,000 euros to me, but I got to stick around for the next three years yes. in order. Best thing means now it's fully mine. Right. And I can do with it what I want. Right. And, and we've done it different ways. We've done it sometimes where, you know, each year a person vests a little bit and maybe in the first year or two, they don't vest very much, or maybe they vest at a certain rate, but then there's a second uh, clause that can be in there to say that, okay, if you leave the company within your first four years or some, if you, if you're looking for long-term employees, that even if you have these percentages that we can buy it back from you for exactly what we, what you paid for it, which if you paid nothing or whatever, or some very low valuation that's punitive so that if they leave as soon as they get some, then we can take it back at a lower price or, or at a predetermined rate. And then if they stay longer than that, then it's theirs. And if they ever leave, they can potentially sell it or the value would be market value. I'm really curious about this. Can you raise your hand if you work for a company in Croatia? Like if you're not your, so you, you, you have a job but you don't work for yourself. There's not that many people here. Okay. And then like put your hand up now if you own stock in that company. Yeah, so this is still like this is this is really new, right? Right. Yeah. To, to, it's completely yeah, new and yeah. I think most probably should become a, a standard. Yeah. I feel that way. I mean, uh, we've seen it a lot in, in IT, yeah. but yeah. we haven't seen it anywhere else. So uh, I hope it, it will become, uh, you know, a part of the other industries on, on how you solve things, especially in today's uh, uh, labor market or employee market, whatever we call it, because we have huge problems with big turnovers because and, and, and there is a lack of uh, uh, employees and so on. So I think this could be a very good technique to have people uh, uh, for a longer time in the company and, and a good incentive for that, for sure. All right. And in, in an ESOP, typically it, it's structured where every employee in the company can get ownership, even if it's little bits based on your position or your salary or things like that. And so everyone has a little bit of that mentality. In my experience, what I'm more familiar with is making sure that your key employees, you know, none of the companies I'm part of are an ESOP. So it's, it's just a thing where we identify key employees, key positions, or maybe we're trying to hire someone. And maybe in the early stage of your company, you don't have quite as much money, but you know they have good experience and they will be a, a valuable member of your team. And so you offer them some equity to come on, but you probably also have a, a vesting clause that they have to be there for at least three years or five years or something to be able to to leave with that you know yeah yeah for sure okay where do we go from here <laughs> i think a good place to go so that like we i think we really did that the some some real deep uh 
uh, stuff about uh, uh, um, about franchising. Maybe just to pull back a little bit. Uh, we have a lot of young people here who are at the start of their journeys and stuff. And so maybe, and I, I the, the topic I threw out uh, for this is a little bit about courage uh, and the role of courage in um, uh, in entrepreneurship and business leadership. And so maybe just uh, each of you could talk a little about what you've learned along the way about um, how do you have the guts to do this? You know, how, how to to start out and. I think for a lot of people, it's, uh, leaders are both born and made. There's some family stuff there. There's some how you look at the world, your faith, your your worldview and stuff. So kind of where where does it all come from for you guys? That, that's a great question. I think for me, again, it, it developed a little later. And having been around part of a team that already knew had a lot of those elements of we, we had a lawyer, we had a construction guy, we had an IT guy, we had a couple of great operators, and I was the finance guy. And so we had a lot of the pieces there to really be able to leverage that to then go start new businesses or buy into franchises or, or whatever and know that we have a pretty good team that can execute on on most ideas and and maybe refine them things like that that was helpful but still each time we go into a new business there's always that risk of failure and and so it's i think once you've seen a little success, that, that motivates you to, to take that risk and be willing to step out and do that. But uh, I'm curious, you know, with your thoughts, really starting, uh, you know, early on with uh, that. Yeah, well, <clears throat> look, <clears throat> uh, when you're younger, it's easier to be honest. <laughs> That's how it is. Uh, yeah, not, not to... Uh, hmm. Okay, when they ask me this question, I always say like, well, look, d just don't think about it. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know, it's, it's the same thing if you're afraid of heights and, and you have to walk on, on a roof. Uh, don't look down. <laughs> That's what it's all about. Just don't look down and don't think about anything. Just focus on, you know, building whatever you're building. That's one thing. Second thing, look. When you got nothing to lose, <laughs> then it's not a problem. So, uh, you know, if you're bootstrapping from zero, look, honestly, I mean, what do you got to lose? Nothing. But is that, is that a good encouragement for young people to think about, uh, what do you call it, like uh, uh, low investment businesses? You can just start with like a little bit of capital. Like don't merit mortgage your parents' apartment. If you're very yeah, try not to. <laughs> <laughs> Although, I mean, look, try not to. Uh, for some, it worked. You know, yeah. so, sometimes it's like, you know, burn the ships and yeah. that's it. Now you have to do it. <laughs> I mean, uh, uh, I don't think there's a, a formula that applies to everybody and everything. Okay. So uh, uh, that's what it is. But bottom line, uh, if, if you feel that, you know, uh, uh, you want to do something, I, I, I just say, go ahead and do it. And, you know, the name of the game is that you will find out throughout the journey. And, and, and it is a journey. Yeah. That's how it is. So uh, uh, don't expect that there will be a certain point in your life when everything will be perfect so that you make a successful <laughs> company. <laughs> that will never happen. That's how it is. Yeah. So uh, might as well start while you're young <laughs> did you dream of business, starting a company when you were young was that no i dreamt i will be a rock star and then <laughs> a, a surfer and, and things like that so no but <clears throat> i remember one, one thing uh, uh, we were at one beach in uh, near uh, rieka mm -hmm. and uh, I, I was driving my uh, uh, grandfather's renault chetri you know nice. it's uh, i love that car awesome. yes <laughs> Katrica. Uh, uh, <laughs> so, anyways, and, and uh, we came to this beach waiting for uh, Maestral Wind. Uh -huh. And uh, I, yeah, I was obviously, I think, maybe 18. I just started driving. And then one guy came uh, with a new uh, Jeep Wrangler. And he had a, a new surfboard that we never saw before on, on the top of his roof. And I'm looking, and I, I asked the other guys, and so. Who's this guy? So I don't know. He got some company of his own. So he can, I don't know. Ah, okay. Ah. So that's how you do it. So like you know, you you build your own business. So you get the money, but you also have the time to do stuff that you like. Uh -huh. And that that was my you know how would I say incentive to 
uh, uh, to look into the way where, you know, uh, uh, entrepreneurship. So mm -hmm. uh, that's why at the beginning I said, I think it's about the freedom, mm -hmm. at least for me. <laughs> so yeah. uh, uh, that, that's yeah. what it is. And, and I truly enjoyed with the first company, uh, with a, a real estate uh, guide and, and ads, uh, I truly lived that way. I mean, I would do what I had to do in the company, but you know, oh, Bora wind in two uh, hours. Uh, <laughs> see you later. <laughs> you can never do that as an employee. Yeah. 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 What's your family background? Ah, uh, no, absolutely, no, absolutely not. I mean, uh, uh, my dad, he he's a seaman, so he's engineer working. Uh, he used to work on, on big ships. My mom used to work in a post office. And uh, uh, my, my grandfather, the, the Renault Chetri guy, you know, I, I remember like I already sold my first company and his question was, boy, when are you going to get a real job? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so you can expect that. You know? mm, yeah. That's good. Yeah. Yeah, I think freedom is a big deal. I think for most of the most successful people that I know personally or have read about, that usually there's something bigger than money that is yeah. what you're what you're looking for. Because money really is just a tool. It it can help you to acquire other things, but I was looking more for time for using that with family or with my church. You know, we were just here to, to be able to take time off a couple times a year and go on mission trips like we're here uh, in Croatia for this week to do a men's retreat and, and do some other things while we're here and partnering together with folks that we've known for, for years. And so really that was, it was much more about time, but in order to be able to have time to do that, you have to have something that's you know, if that's making money for you uh, or, or providing you the ability to take that time to do those things that, that you love or to spend time with family that, that you love, obviously. And I think that was one of the challenges, too, as in, in your early years, as you're younger, you're having to put a lot of time into things. But that's also when maybe you're raising a family. And so how do you balance raising a family during the same years that you have to be putting so much time into your business? I'm curious if you had thoughts on that. Uh, yeah, I, I'll just tell you a story that will give you an idea. Uh, not about me, but my partner. So when we were starting this first company, so uh, I, I sent him an email uh, from Canada still there. And I said, like, Dennis. Look at this. We need to do this in Croatia. Oh, just real estate with photos and things like that and so on. And uh, at that point of time, uh, his, uh, he was, his wife was pregnant for the second time. And, uh, you know, if we start with this company, it's not like you start making money from day one. So uh, what he did was actually uh, he took uh, a father's maternity leave. I think that's okay. how it's called <laughs> in order to, you know, to kind of finance this initial part. So, uh, uh, you know, it's, it's definitely hard, but, you know, you, you do what it takes and, and you find a way how, how to provide for the family and uh, uh, how to build business at the same time. I mean, uh, uh, I don't know, uh, maybe uh, uh, you can have a job and, and start preparing everything on a side. You know, that's how we did it. Right. And I, I was still young. I was half idiot, par pardon my French, so I didn't think about that. But, you know, uh, 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 I was 22. You know, we, uh, I was in completely different mindset. But for Dennis, that, that was like, you know, yeah. he already has a son now. The, the second uh, uh, kid is coming and you're starting... Uh, a real estate ad with some guy that is now studying in Canada that used to work with you in the real... I mean, the wife also needs to be very understanding. So, well, no, one, no one understood... I mean, almost no one understood real estate as a business where people actually were agents and stuff. That was yeah. 20 years ago. I mean, that was totally brand new to that. Yeah, right? yeah, was, yeah. And, and uh, look, it's, it's, a, it's a great job uh, to learn sales because... Uh. Bottom line, honestly, if you're not a good salesman, you know, <laughs> better learn how to sell. And, and with, with real estate, how it works in Croatia, you're only based on a success fee. So if you don't do any sales, you don't get anything. Uh, there, there's no fixed pay monthly or anything like yeah. that. Yeah. So, you, you know, here's a funny, just sorry if I'm bothering too much, but no. here's a funny one about uh, motivating somebody. So anyways, when I started working in that first real estate agency, I had a boss. He was a genius, I think. <clears throat> so I came there and he's looking at me. Uh, I was 
a kid, I mean, what, 19 years old, something like that. And he was asking me questions like, uh-huh, so what do you do? Uh-huh, okay, okay. And I was answering and so on. And he was like, so what kind of car do you like? And I said like, oh, I love Alfa Romeo. And he said, oh, okay. You know, there's one guy that started working now. He's driving this new 156 red color. And I was like, really? Yeah, he bought it from his, this job like in six months. That's like, you can make money here easily. And I was like, oh, okay. You know, and so I said like, okay, anyways, you're hired and that, that's it. Two weeks after that, puff, first sale. Man, 3%. We had Deutschmark still yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> back then. <laughs> then that, for me, that was huge amount of money. And two weeks after that, poof, second sale. And I was like, man, this is great. I I'm really going to buy that Alfa Romeo, that's for sure. <laughs> so anyways, and I continued. I, I was averaging two and a half sales per month. For wow. me, that was normal. That's Years after, I, I, I see that agency owner again. And I said, hey, how are you? And we were talking and blah, 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 and so on. And at some point, and he tells me, you know those first two sales that you did? I set you up for that. Uh, <laughs> you know, that's how he got me into mindset that I thought that was normal and that I was really good at that job. <laughs> so anyways, I, I started laughing. I, I will never forget that. <laughs> That's I think great. sales is such a fascinating uh, expertise, and it seems still really undeveloped in Croatia. Like it always, honestly, kind of like when they call me on the phone, like, "Oh, I have something to sell you," and I'm like, oh "I'm not God. interested." And they're like, no. "Okay, sorry." And then they hang yeah. up. I'm like, "Man, in America, they mm. never would have let me off so easily. They would have like, <laughs> they just keep at you. Know, like, they're oh, yeah, they're yeah. getting a little better, but but it's, it, sales is an interesting uh, it is. A skill set I, I, that actually is really valuable. And I, I think so. Yeah, and and there was a uh, years ago, I think in Harvard Business Review, there was a. Uh, uh, a whole piece about the sale. The, the whole issue was about the sale. And, and there was one interesting part for me uh, that, that I still remember. They did analysis of what are salespeople uh, perceived in different cultures, different ah. countries. So it turns out that salespeople people are not perceived well in countries that are, uh, let's say, lazy. Let me put it that way. And in countries that are very productive, Salespeople are very valued. Huh. <laughs> so, uh, 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 you know, being salesman in different countries can be can mean yeah. a different thing. And I think that uh, uh, we, as Croatia, as this market, actually coming from uh, uh, I don't know uh, what was it, fifty years of system where. Uh, supply was always actually uh, 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 bigger than uh, actually demand was always bigger than the supply. You know, wh why would you need a sales guy? Yeah. Every, yeah. <laughs> you need the goods. <laughs> well, people here love to say every product has a buyer. Yeah. You know, every product like, oh, I'm, I'm American, I'm like, that's not like, no. Yeah, but anyways, yeah, sales is a big thing. And uh, I think, you know, if you truly want to learn how to how to do sales, I think uh, any, any, any job that is based on uh, success fee only will give you uh, yeah, a really good training. part of your compensation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, absolutely. I agree that sales and, and the ability to to understand and be good at selling is important because even if you're not the one selling the product, but you're getting your business started, you have to sell. If you don't have the money, you're selling a bank or investors on your idea. Exactly. And, and to really pitch an idea that successfully to get people to give you money, uh, hoping that they'll get it back based on your effort takes quite an ability to to sell. Uh, another thing that I think is a, a learned skill set that goes into so many areas of life is negotiating oh. and you know even even with my kids I'm negotiating with them in their bedtime or how what they're eating for how dinner old now are now I, how old are your kids so my my youngest is 17 and my oldest is 26 so I'm, I'm mostly through a lot of that that phase and you may not think of it as I'm not giving them a choice like I'm gonna tell them what to do but even then you are still trying to get an outcome and how you go about doing that is is important and if you try different ways you you may have varying levels of success and so negotiating just plays into really every area of life even 
you know, just where you go to dinner with your wife or, or, you know, as you're evaluating, you know, something that you want and something that she wants and there's not enough money to do both, uh, you know, how do you, how do you negotiate? And just, so family, work, certainly at work, it plays all over the place with work, with suppliers and, and buyers and, and all of these things. So uh, negotiating is another skill set that I think is really critical for anyone to, to get better at and, and become... Can you uh, give one, just like, is there like one thing that springs to mind about like how to be a better negotiator tomorrow, maybe? Uh, my favorite book that I ever read yeah. was Never Split the Difference yeah. <laughs> by Chris Voss. Yeah. So, we had him as a speaker at Global Leadership Summit. Oh, that's, that's awesome. Yeah. yeah, yeah, great. Great stories about some, you know, FBI uh, crisis negotiation, uh, kidnapping negotiations, things like that. And, and then he, he relates all of it into business as well. And now he has a business consulting firm, uh, the Black Swan Group. And, and it just uh, super helpful to me. I've, I've read the book multiple times. It's been translating the creation mm -hmm. sure. yeah. yeah yeah this is where i feel that you know our education system here uh we, would need an update for sure uh like we we definitely don't have like uh, what i had in in canada was personal selling as a subject oh wow and that was amazing for me because uh, uh <clears throat> what they did uh first thing that the the, the professor said I'm going to teach you everything about this, then you have to forget it, and then you have to use it. <laughs> that was the first. <laughs> Second thing, we were filmed every class. Oh, so, wow. you know, how to do a chit chat, how to ask questions, how to listen, you know, how to uh, 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 kind of uh, present the benefits. Don't go into features, go into benefits. <laughs> you know, <laughs> how to close the sale, how to do the follow up. Everything like that. I mean, I wish we have that on, on, on our colleges or even earlier in, in the high school as well. So, so Ante Mihailovic is here this evening. Does some sales. Yeah. yeah. We can do that. <laughs> yeah. Say hi to Ante afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> no, but that's, yeah, it's really true. It's a whole, um, I think just learning. I mean, look, I, I was an electrical engineering major. And I was raised by a father who told me the worst thing that ever happened in his company was when consultants were brought in. So, you know, all, my, all my feelings growing up were like, ah, you know, and then, and, but I met people, I'd always, when I would meet people from business school, they'd shake your hand differently, they'd look you in the eyes and say, Nolan, nice to meet you, Nolan, and they'd repeat your name, and they all, like, Harvard, Stanford business school people, man, they just like, but, but I, I eventually learned, well, they there's something really significant to this. They they have a real skill that actually yeah. like really matters to go out there and to know how to yeah. do that. So uh, let me tell you one thing. Level after that, I always say about surf and fries. We never sold any franchise. Wow. They all came to us to buy it. Oh, that's amazing. So that's yeah. after you read uh, Sun Tzu <laughs> when they said you have to win a war without actually getting into the fight. <laughs> Oh, that's really, that's yeah. really all everybody oh, came to yeah, do. yeah. And we what? never went like, hey, do you want to buy this franchise? It's so good. You, you will make so much money. No. Can you say a little more about that? Is, is because there were people waiting for a good concept in, in, like, uh, in Croatia or outside? I mean, even internationally, you've never done intentional selling? No. Here is how it happened. Wow. We opened the first store. It really does amazing. Then the guy came and he said, like, hey, I want to uh, open your business on a beach. And we were like, okay, where's the location? He said, I don't have a location. I said, what do you mean you don't have a location? He said, well, I want to work on a beach. I said, how are you going to work on a beach without the location? So, well, you think of something. And I was like, okay. And then we thought of like a, a small cart for the beaches. And that's what we have. Th that became the most successful format of Surf and Fries. Wow. Now, what happens next is that other people also start putting that on a beach. And then we have a lot of tourists in Croatia. And now the tourists see the concept. And we were smart enough to put on our packaging, like our business, contact us for franchising. <laughs> now you're getting international in inquiries. So most of the franchises wow. that we sold were people that came for a vacation to Croatia. That's amazing. Saw the concept, contact us. And, <clears throat> and you're still open for fr like franchising? Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Would you recommend that as a start, start thing for somebody who wants to go in? Oh, I think, entrepreneur? yeah. I mean, look, uh, those guys, for example, th that's a great example, uh, uh, the, the small cart. Mm -hmm. The investment at the beginning was 9,400 euros. That's how much it took you to get into the business. On average, they would make 25 to 35,000 euros net per season. You guys listen? So, <laughs> I mean, you know, that's, that's a good way to get into the entrepreneurship and, and, and wow. all this. Stuff. So it's like micro-franchising, basically. That's amazing. Not yeah. a lot of uh, uh, risk. 
even if you decide not to do it anymore, that cart, it's something that can be resold so you yeah. can return your investment and so on. So, the, you know, when you're looking into the franchise, that's something that you also should think about. What if I stop? What do I do with the stuff that I bought? You know, can, can yeah. I, you know? Yeah. Wow. So, that, yeah. Thank you for selling and sharing yeah, some sure. details no with us. That's, oh. that's amazing. Fine. So, yes. So, we have about 15 minutes left. So, thank you all so much for your, all your patient listening so far. So, uh, please be brave enough to be the first person with a question. I'm counting on you. Uh, thank you. Uh, so it was really amazing to listen to you guys. Congrats. It was it's such an impressive story. You mentioned sales coaching. That's like what I do. So oh, yeah. it, was, it was refreshing to hear about that. I got two questions. One of them, have you, both of you, have you ever encountered imposter syndrome? Mm. While you were developing, like thinking, I'm not really good at this. I'm going to freak out if somebody mm. perceives me as a fraud or something. And mm -hmm. second, people stealing your ideas, like copyright infringement, how do you protect from that? I have had uh, imposter syndrome, not so much in the business end, but just with myself as I was growing in my career. Matter of fact, when I went to work with the group that I have been with for the last 15 years that's done all of these different businesses, uh, I was starting really in the area of my specialty, which is financial analysis and, and budgeting, uh, modeling, a lot of that and helping them figure out what were the best business opportunities. And after just a couple of years there, they promoted, I, I got called into my boss, who's the owner, into his office one day, and he promoted me to chief financial officer. And actually, during that conversation, I told him, you know, if after three to six months, you think I'm not your guy and you need to drop me back down to just financial analysis, I, I'm okay with that. <laughs> I just couldn't believe, and I, I, I thought it was beyond me, but uh, and not that I didn't love the opportunity, and it ended up, you know, being great, but, you know, I think a lot of guys I've seen and talked to, there's this self-doubt, you know, each time you get promoted to a new position, you wonder, can I perform, you know, I performed well at the last level, but can I do it at this next level, or at this new, or you start, and then we start a new company, and it's like, hey, I know our last company was successful, or our last two, but is this one going to be successful? Sometimes you wonder about that. So, yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> well, I don't think that much again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, look, I, I think it's it's a natural thing that happens. I think it's almost like a reflex, so, so to speak, and uh, uh, it, it keeps you awake, let me put it that way, because nobody wants to fail at something and so on. But uh, yeah, for me, if it happens, it goes away very quickly. <laughs> That's how it is. Uh, uh, second question yeah, uh, regarding the copycats. We had many copycats. Like, you know, Surf and Fries, I think, from what I know, we had about 100 plus. Wow. 100 plus, uh, which, is, which is really funny because uh, uh, most of them never, never survived second year of operating. So, you know, copy is always a copy. It's never the original. It's always lower quality or whatever it is. And at the beginning, it was crazy frustrating. I was so frustrated when, you know, the, the first copycats, when we saw them and so on. Oh my God, like I couldn't sleep and things like that. Now, I tell, if you need any help, just let me know. It's not a problem. <laughs> Yeah, we have run into that as well. More with uh, Suntan City, where we're the franchisor, there are copycats in the other businesses, but where we're a franchisee, the franchisor does a pretty good job of having the legal staff that's necessary, whether that's in-house or, or out, out of house counsel that takes care of those issues and fights those battles for us. But on Suntan City, we have to fight that. And I think one of the things that we've focused on in that is we will do the things and use lawyers to help you know, fight those, but we feel like our best defense is to operate the best business we can. And we feel like there's not just one or two things that are make us great, but more like eight or 10 things. And we want to be 
always getting at least a little bit better at all of those things so that someone can try and they may come in and they may walk and see it in our stores. Oh, it looks like they're good at one or two things and they copy, maybe they buy the same equipment and use our same pricing and try to do some similar marketing materials, but they don't do maintenance like we do and keep their, their equipment up. Because in with the tanning and the fitness, it's a service there's not very many products that we sell. There's some, but most of it is about providing a great quality service. And part of that is keeping everything running top notch. And I, I don't know about your experiences. A lot of times I've gone into a lot of fitness clubs and there's always some pieces of equipment broken, a treadmill that's down, various things like that. That's very frustrating for customers. And so we, we staffed our own fitness guys and we figured out what's the right you know number of locations that one guy can handle and we employ him we give him a truck we put we we did a lot of tracking in the first few locations we opened what are the main parts that fix 80 percent of the problems and we put those parts on the truck so he can be there diagnose it and fix it in one visit where most of the other uh, gyms that we competed against they used outsourced mechanics who didn't work for the company they had to call them give them the schedule to drop by they would diagnose it then they would order parts and then you know and, and so it might be weeks that a piece of equipment is down thank you all right another question yeah you also have a question. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. so uh, i'm on that uh, was there anyone who came with the uh, wish to start maybe the bigger and better franchise at your place and that you and or somewhere else, not to you, but mm -hmm. and they thought no don't come here, we will pay you just some come here. Because you mentioned before in speech when you want to take the employee, come on no, they, I give you demand, just go away. Is there something similar? In, in your career that you know the story of a non compete is that what you're asking yes please don't come here you, you will be you will smash us here's the money uh -huh. does that happen kind of because it's happening when you maybe in, in the stores uh -huh. when you have a one guy who one company that has projects and sometimes they said okay please don't put their pro projects here we will buy it for well, and we will put our projects on that place. Just yeah. I've not had a lot of experience with that. We we do have some competitors and, and there are times where you put a new location in a place because it's just it's the best location. There are a couple of times where we have made defensive moves you know there's a location open it would be great we don't really need another location maybe in that market but we go ahead and put a second one in there to try to prevent someone else from coming but we try not to do a lot of that because at the end of the day if your competitor is determined they're going to find a good location or maybe even build one it's it's really hard at the end of the day to stop people from coming and so again we just try to focus on doing the best we can picking the best locations we can and, and operating better than we think anyone else can operate. Yeah. <clears throat> for us, it, it, uh, the only thing that I can think of that, that actually happened was, uh, for example, when you tried to get into the shopping malls and, uh, you know, the, the, the guys that are already in the um, food court and they sign agreement that way so that no other F&B brand can, you know, get a location. So we had a situation like that. We have a situation at the moment which is not similar to that, for, but for me it's, it's a bit crazy. So uh, uh, in Germany we operate on football stadiums and now there will be a Euro Cup this summer, right? And uh, the Euro rules are that, I mean, that, that's how they did it. Like, you can sell your fries, but there cannot be any logo packaging or anything that way. so like you know there are certainly sometimes they limit you in that way that's at least our experience that we had so far we never had a situation where somebody would say like if you don't get into this market we will actually pay you stay to stay out i never had that but i, I would have to give a really good thought on what i would decide <laughs> <there>. <laughs> well, one other thing that we have done and this this was harder to do in the early days when our concept was small and landlords didn't 
you know, we didn't have necessarily great value to them, but as our businesses grew and we got bigger and more recognized, or maybe within certain markets or states, we had more of a presence, we could ask for more things because the landlord would want us in their center. So we could ask them in signing our lease that they would agree to not lease any of their other properties to anyone who competes with our concept. So that, but it took a little time to be able to get that kind of a return uh, quid pro quo from a, a landlord, so. My name is Silvio, I have a juice company. Uh, I'm thinking about franchising my business and uh, main, uh, what's the uh, main... Uh, no, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> no. What is the most important combination of location? Location. Okay, so uh, when when we uh, <clears throat> now it it mogu uh, na engleskom uh, nastaje. Okay, so uh, in in franchising, it's uh, what we call it's a site selection manual. So like w when when I work with clients that are getting into the franchising, like they have a brand and they want to become a franchise system, then we one of the documents that we actually do for them is called site selection manual. So. For example, uh, uh, we start with simple things. Number one, size of, of the store. You know, it can be minimum this, maximum that, optimum that. Then we go into a bit of a technical stuff. Okay, you know, how much uh, energy do you need? Some concepts need like three phase electricity, I don't know how many kilowatts and so on. If it's not available at that location, there's nothing you can do. Uh, on top of that, we also have a, a ventilation for some concepts. You know, you need to have a, if you cannot make a ventilation, do, don't even look at it. Then we get into stuff like uh, okay, uh, footfall. Uh, for most of the concepts, that's something that is very interesting. So, what's the frequency of people walking there? <clears throat> for example, I'll give you uh, an example for surf and fries. How far we went with that one. So we figured out that you need a certain number of people walking by. But then, when we were opening more and more locations, this is a good thing about franchising because you keep, keep learning. Uh, it's important at what time of the day. Because we know that our shops do about 70% of the revenues after 5 p.m. So mm. Because we opened one location that was full of people, but in the morning. And in Croatia, nobody buys French fries in the morning. <laughs> they all buy like, you know, pastry and, and yeah. things like that, right? Uh, next thing that we figured out, it's not only how many people at, at what time of the day that they are uh, uh, they're walking, but how fast are they walking? Ah. Because we figure out that the location that it's, uh, I don't know, location between a, a bus station and a tram station and people are walking really fast, nothing much happens. You know, they don't stop. But on a location where people are walking slowly and where you have couples and groups of people, our sales are like five times better. Wow. Uh, How do you do that research? You just go and watch? Uh, yeah. Uh -huh. Sometimes it's simple as that. So, you know, you just go and watch. That's how it is. Mm -hmm. I mean, now these days you have a lot of technologies and, yeah, you know, yeah. cameras that do AI and they do all the analysis. That, well, I feel like, you know, you just can't, and you, you need to have the feeling, you know. Yeah. For some locations or some concepts, actually, it's important whether you have a parking or not. You know, very important. Uh, then we take a look at uh, what uh, demographic aspects are, are, are there. You know, like, what, what, what's the medium uh, household income? Are we looking at medium, higher, whatever? Because that kind of has to relate to, uh, uh, to what your customers usually are. Also, you look at the age and you look at the gender. For example, for surf and fries, about 70% again of customers are females. <laughs> really? So, yeah, 70%? Yeah, yeah, unbelievable, but that's how it is. Is it part because, like, you guys yeah, do it? Yeah, not. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, so you have to look. Okay, so now that we know that, like when I work with a, a, a client, okay, well, I call them, what are the generators? As, as what, what neighbors do you need to have yes. at that location? Mm -hmm. That's something very important because if you have like uh, on that location, uh, for example, nail saloon, uh, you know, things like that, this is where you need to be. But if you have like some, I don't know, 
car shop, uh, <laughs> like, I don't know, tools shop, and so on, and you need females, mm, not good. So you need where, uh, you know, what attracts female part of the, uh, uh, you know, uh, customers, and what can actually do an overspill to your concept. That would be the main things that we would look at the location. Yeah, yeah I agree. I think I would say almost everything exactly the same as, as what Andrea said. Um, you know, we, we will look along with what time of day are the people there. You know, if you're on, if it's traffic, if it's walking traffic, then it's not such a big deal if you're in an area that has a lot of foot traffic. But if you're on a road and it's it's vehicle traffic that is concerning, then you want easy access, maybe to be at an intersection with a stoplight, especially if people, you know, have to turn from the opposite side of the street. But we would rather, you know, if we have a business that's busy in the evening, we'd like to be on the side of traffic that's busier with the going home traffic. If it's in, if it's a morning business, then you want to be on the the, com the side of traffic coming to work, it's so that people that don't have to cross yeah. the road because that takes more time. You know, if they can just pull right in and right out and go, it's much simpler. And, and making people's lives easier to get to you is significant. That's a crazy level of detail, right? Yeah, no, no, for sure. Yeah, but look, imagine if your uh, Starbucks is a great example. So if you're selling coffee, you're selling it in the morning most probably. So, you know, when the people are going to work, you need to be on that side of yeah. the road. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Well, thank you guys so much. This has been amazing, especially uh, Andrea for you coming from, from Rijeka. Well, he uh, came from the U.S. So, <laughs> <laughs> oh, so okay, one more. Okay, one more. Yeah, sure. Okay. We'll limit their time of response. Okay. <laughs> uh, in one word. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's good. Uh, well, basically, you are both so different, yes. but you have one thing in common. You are both successful. In mm -hmm. one word. What is the reason for that? You, you share one thing good. that makes you successful. What is that? Ooh, that's a good one. Franchise. Franchise. I would say it's a will. Yeah, for sure. I think I integrity, which for me comes from my faith, uh, is what I would attribute most of, and you could say a lot of things, hard work, or, you know, other, but I think integrity has been critical for me. Yeah, for uh, you? Yeah, I would say um, maybe passion. Yeah. That's good. Yeah. That's great. Wow, that's that's a great that's a great way to end it. So because we really want to honor your time before Thank you. so you can get home. Do you guys are bringing five guys into creation? Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> All right, yeah, thank you guys so much for doing this. It's a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. So let me just say two more things for the, before you go. John is not in a hurry. He says he doesn't even need to sleep tonight. <laughs> so if you have more questions for John, he's going to be here. Uh, Andre, we want to make sure we give him a chance to, yeah. to go. I'll stay for a while if anybody needs yeah. anything. But, uh, yeah. And uh, we did tape this. And um, so we will put this on uh, on our YouTube channel for the Focus eventually. And um, and everybody who registered for this evening, I'll send you an email when, when that's ready. So, And if you didn't, you can come to me and say if you want a reminder when it's done. But thank you all so much for coming. This has been great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well done. Thank you.